So welcome everybody uh, to our presentation of the OVC admissions um, requirements and the process. The goal tonight is for me to kind of talk about um, how the admissions process works for the Ontario Veterinary College DVM program and um, some of the ways you can improve your chances of being accepted. Um, and that will include talking about the selection process and um, how to maximize your chances at each stage. So um, I want to first of all also welcome people here. So we have a whole bunch of people that are hopeful veterinarians, which is fantastic. Um, we have a few people who we'll introduce at the end that are part of the Future Vets Club. So the University of Guelph has a very active and dynamic Future Vets Club. Um, we range anywhere from 300 to 400 members every year. And uh, by the rules, a quarter of those members can come from outside the University of Guelph. So if you're from another university and you're interested in being invited to events and knowing more, then you can definitely uh, become a member and um, you can ask Amanda at the end. Uh, she'll turn her microphone and her camera at the end and you can chat with her. I also want to welcome some of the pre-vet advisors from other universities. Uh, really glad that you're here and please, uh, you know, ask any questions you have either during the presentation or after. And um, uh, if we haven't already connected, you can email me and I'd be happy to do an in uh, like a virtual presentation to your uh, pre-vet students. And uh, we're just happy to do that. So uh, this is the OVC website. You can see here that the address at the top is ovc.uoguelph.ca. And then if you scroll down a bit, the first big tab here is learn. So you'd go there to find out more about the VET program. And this is uh, the tab that would take you to the admissions information. So this will change. This is uh, the website as it appears now, but we're just about to launch a new beautiful website uh, for recruitment, which will replace this, but it's the same link. It'll take you to the same information. And then applying to DVM is uh, the main section, and there is a lot to read. I understand that, but please do go through it carefully um, and you know write down your questions as you go if you have any. But I'm going to go through it with you tonight so that you understand everything you need to know about the DVM program here at the University of Guelph. So for those of you that don't know where we are, Guelph is about a 60 minute, 90 minute drive from Mississauga. Uh, down the 401 towards Windsor. We're really close to big city if that's something you want to experience, but we're also 10 minutes from farmland and there are dairy farms near us. We have, um, you know, the, the city of Guelph is just big enough to support a, a pretty agricultural university and we have our own teaching cows and teaching horses. Uh, we have a nice uh, barn right um, about five minute walk from the main OVC buildings and that's where we keep some of our teaching animals and we have a central animal facility. So lots happening here at the University of Guelph if you love animals, which most people do if they want to become a veterinarian which is fantastic. Uh, but you also need to have a very keen interest in science because it is a medical program. And so uh, the first thing you need to do if you're in high school is to make sure that you're in the academic stream and um, uh, do what you need to do to get into a bachelor's degree at whatever university you want to go to. So there's no rule that says that you have to come to the University of Guelph to get into the vet program down the road. But there are perks, and we'll talk about that after. Um, so for university, like we say, you don't have to go to Guelph. You can go to any university, but uh, and you don't have to do a bachelor of science either. Um, you know, if you want to do arts and science or arts or even commerce, you can. Um, but because a lot of the prerequisite courses for the vet school are science, uh, the, then usually most people tend to go into a Bachelor of Science and they tend to be most attracted to the biological sciences. That tends to be the makeup of a pre-vet student, but if you're not in that mold, that's great too because we love diversity and we also allow people to re return back to school after a bachelor's and a career. Um, so if you are older and uh, have already gone through school and are thinking about going back to school to get your veterinary medicine degree, 
that's totally doable as well. I won't talk much about that today. Um, we're going to focus very much on the undergraduate domestic or Canadian cohort, although uh, what's true for this cohort is certainly true for the others. Um, we have 120 people in each of the veterinary classes, so we accept 100 students that are applying from an undergrad program, meaning a bachelor's program. And again, uh, you don't have to finish the undergrad. What we require in terms of a prerequisite is that you have to finish four semesters or two years full time. And for us, the definition of full time is not what is the definition at a university. So typically a university full time is considered four full time uh, semester uh, courses per semester, uh, but for us it's five. It's not considered uh, a residency when you go to school full time somewhere. I could go to the to school in the U.S., but I, that wouldn't make me American, for instance. All right, so let's go down and talk about um, the courses that you need to take. So we talked about the fact that you need to be full time studies, um, and that's uh, the the definition here of full-time semester. So uh, Guelph, um, a full-time one semester course is equivalent to 0.5 credits. In other schools, it's five, no, three, excuse me, uh, credits. So a full-time semester would be 15 credits or 15 credit hours. So these are the courses that you need to take um, and you need to finish them by the fall, the end of fall semester. Uh, the year before you want to get entry into the program. So if you are planning to apply for entry in fall 23, then this semester is last semester you can take courses and they would be considered for uh, application to your veterinary program. So, um, so that means that if you're taking a course next semester and you want to apply to the vet program for next year, that could not be used because we wouldn't have the final mark in time. Uh, we need your final transcripts on March 1st and your final marks for winter would not be ready until probably May-ish, right? The beginning of May. So we wouldn't have the marks in time, all right? Um, so these are the courses that you need. We need two biological sciences, a cell biology, a genetics, a biochemistry, um, organic chemistry is not biochemistry, but normally you do need to take uh, orgo to get to biochemistry. So this is typically a second year course, uh, statistics, and you need humanities and, yeah, humanities and social science. And that's a very big category. It can include pretty much um, anything that relates to learning how people tick or how people behave. And again, this is good stuff because so much of veterinary medicine is not just about animals, but about people too. Uh, because every animal that you're going to work with as a veterinarian um, has a person usually attached to it. Either it's the farmer or the pet owner, parent, um, or uh, you know, people that you're going to have to work with in a clinical setting or any as part of a team. So um, the people skills and learning how to work with people is exceptionally important in veterinary medicine in addition to knowing all the stuff about animals. So so these are the eight required courses um, and again when you are ready to apply you have to have those two years of undergrad done so that means you can apply in your third year and you don't have to finish your bachelor's degree but you have to have all these courses done sometime within your full time semesters. Um, a very important rule is that you can't repeat a course. So if you take biochemistry and you don't love the mark that you got and you want to improve your marks, you're going to have to take a third year biochemistry in order to replace that second year biochemistry that you passed. Um, so be careful about that. We really don't allow any uh, course uh, repeating or substantial um, overlap in content. And the reason for that is because we do always want you to be trying your hardest to get the best marks, have good life balance. Um, and uh, we feel that if you repeat a course, it's, you know, it's easy to get a higher mark in a course that you've already taken, right? And we don't really want you to do that. We'd rather you try your hand at a course that's an upper level. Um, the other thing is, is that when you apply, 
you get to choose which courses you put forward. So obviously, if you've taken 20 bio so biological sciences, put forward the two that are the highest marks, not necessarily the ones that you think will be impressed by. That's really not important. Um, so again, uh, that's how people uh, can uh, do their best when they apply uh, right away by putting forward marks with the highest marks that they have if they have many different uh, courses in the same category. So if you have 90s and you, you know, and they fit the category, then by all means use those marks to put forward. If you have um, two, two courses that are ecology related, but they're acceptable, and one course that's a lower mark, but it's got animal biology in it, doesn't matter. Just use the courses that have the highest marks. Elizabeth, sorry to interrupt you. Someone has their hand raised. There have been questions in the chat. Do you want to wait till the end to answer questions? Yeah, or? I'm going to do. I'm going to do it by sections. So let me just finish talking about what the requirements are, and then I'll go to the chat and answer some questions. Okay. okay or you know what, Amanda, it'd be probably better if you read me the questions when I'm ready, because sure. then I don't have to change the menu on my okay. face, so everyone can still see see this. Okay. Thanks, Amanda. All right. So. So we have those eight courses and the two full time semesters and the final step that you have to do before um, we're ready to do our first ranking is you have to write the Casper assessment. So that's new in the last cycle. Uh, we did Casper the year before, but it wasn't part of the first mix, but now it is. And um, uh, I think I have a section here on Casper. There's lots of rules around courses, so make sure that you read them. Um, one of the things uh, that you need to do if you don't go to the University of Guelph is that uh, you need to put forward your courses that you want to take and make sure that they're acceptable in terms of content. And then let's see, I'm just trying to see if there's, uh, I think here we go, Casper. All right, so this is the section on the website about Casper. Casper is an online assessment that tests your soft skills, um, which is really important in veterinary medicine. So it looks for things like ethical reasoning, sound judgment, critical thinking, um, all the things that are really important for both the veterinary student experience as well as being a, su a successful veterinarian. And what they are, it's a 90 minute uh, online assessment where you either read over a scenario or they have a video and they play out a scenario and then they ask you questions. So example, uh, they're not veterinary related, but they're like, you're in a meeting and someone says something aggressive or questionable to another person in the meeting. And then after the video plays, you're you have to answer questions by typing, you know, your idea about what you think you would do in this situation and why. That's very important. You have to substantiate why you've, you're choosing that course of action uh, because that's what they want to hear about. They want to hear about your rationale. And um, just as a tip, uh, because you have to type out your answers, you can be accommodated if you have any kind of processing, um, you know, disability or if uh, you know it's difficult for you to type they'll give you extra time but do practice keyboarding it's a very important uh, part of the test and you know the more you practice the faster and more accurate you get they don't um, uh, penalize you for any typing mistakes or keyboarding mistakes uh, but um, but it's good to you know beforehand practice a little bit so you get used to being able to put your thoughts um, down I mean we all keyboard now right but you know if you practice you make it a little faster and that'll certainly help okay so that's the academic piece and then I'll go into more like this the, the 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 selection stuff so Amanda if you want to go ahead and um, and uh, read out any of the questions I haven't answered so far Sure. Um, well, I know that someone had their hand up before. Does that person want to unmute and ask their question? If not, then we can just go to the chat questions. Oh, yes, a hand is raised. Wait. It's hard for me to look at the chat and see the people. Yeah, go ahead and, and unmute yourself to ask the question. 
Hi. So I was just wondering about um, the timeline of taking your prerequisites and then the application process. So, for example, if I was taking one of my prerequisites in this fall semester, would I still be able to apply this December? Yep. OK, perfect. Yeah, so yeah. Just the, the thing you have to keep in mind with courses is that we need final marks in March. So March 1st is the deadline for um, um, for transcripts. So these are the dates and I think they're on here as well. And they should be summarized. Oh, there's so much to read through. <laughs> oh, my God. All right, here we go. So these are the deadlines. So the first deadline is December 1st, and that's when it's basically you just say I'm applying and you pay your application fee. Um, so for if for if you're at a at the University of Guelph, it's the internal, you know, internal transfer form, right? And then uh, for if you're not at the University of Guelph, it's on the LUAC site, same site you apply to university from high school, um, but you would apply through there to our VET program. It's considered undergrad because you don't have to finish your undergrad to get to it. A grad program is when you finish a bachelor's degree and then you apply to that program. So we're considered undergrad in Canada. So that's the first deadline, um, December 1st. And then um, as soon as you're done uh, submitting your application and you get um, registered, you'll get a U of G email if you are from another university and you'll have access to what we call Web Advisor, which is uh, an online kind of system for you to access documents. And there you'll have access to uh, the background information form, which we call the BIF, which is the application. Um, and that's where you have to put down all of your experience. So another piece of advice for everybody, if you haven't already, start logging your hours um, at whatever you do, jobs, veterinary experience, animal experience, all that stuff. And make sure you put down what you've done and, you know, the hours and the dates and all that stuff. Uh, so when you fill in the background information form, they're going to ask you for um, all of the kind of experiences that you've had. So veterinary experience, of course, is very important. Um, you need to have uh, uh, have worked directly with a veterinarian. So the vet has to have been in the room and you have to have been working with them, not like in a lecture and they're teaching. Um, animal experience is when you work with animals and the vet's not in the room. So it can also be at a clinic um, when you're working with the vet techs or just getting them ready for surgery or, you know, changing cages, stuff like that. And that's more about learning how to handle different animals. And uh, the other stuff is also very important because you need to prove to us that you know how to work with other people. And that can be from working uh, at uh, jobs, summer jobs, uh, working at reception at the clinic, things like that. So um, that's all that stuff that you're going to put into the background information form. So a very long answer to, to the question. <laughs> Sorry about that. But that's the, the second deadline. And then um, the third deadline is March 1st uh, for the other documents. So that's when we ask for your uh, official transcripts. You'll also need references. And if you didn't, uh, if you weren't educated in English, um, then you need to do an English proficiency exam. Uh, all right. Sorry, again, Amanda, I don't know if I, that's the end of that question, uh, but um, did I answer that? Yeah, thank you so much. I appreciate yeah, it. Sorry, that was a very long answer to a no very short question. At all. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Amanda, um, any other questions? Yeah, so there are still a few hand raises and quite a few questions in the chat. So I don't know if you want to go through all of them now. There's still a couple of people who have their hands raised. Um, uh, okay, so if your question is about what I've just talked about, then uh, I'll answer it. But uh, I'm going to talk about the selection process and how that works too. So just limit your question to what's happened so far. I'll answer, why don't we just take the next 10 minutes to answer questions and then uh, we'll we'll move along and then I'll, I'll take another break to answer questions. Sure, okay. so Julia has um, their hand raised. Okay. Would you like to unmute? Hello. Hi. Um, I just had a quick question regarding, um, you stated that uh, the course requirements, so like let's just say if you took a year two course but your grade wasn't that great, so you have to take a year three. 
what happens if, for example, um, there's a chemistry 1040 and then it's like a prerequisite and then you have to take a chemistry 1050. What happens in those situations where it's like a prerequisite? That's fine. I mean, as long as it's the natural way that the courses are, um, what are, we're most concerned with is like a repeat in content, right? So obviously, if one course is a prerequisite for the other one, you have to take them in that order, right? Okay. So like, what about um for like submitting? Because you said that you get to pick which classes you're submitting. Like that doesn't impact it then? No. Okay. Just okay. as long as you make sure it's in the right order. Um, like you wouldn't want to take that second course and then take the one that's its prerequisite after. Right. Um, and just, uh, I don't know if people realize this, but you can use courses from any semester as a prerequisite. So if you knocked it out of the park in your first year and you have a couple of courses that you did fantastic, then you can use those marks too. Okay, so it doesn't matter like which like year level it is as long as it's a, a prereq for the program. Yep. Okay, great. Okay, thank you so much. Okay, next, um, Lauren, if you'd like to unmute yourself and ask your question. Hi. Um, for the like logging of hours in or around like veterinary uh, services, do like if I did a co-op in grade 11 and grade 12, does that count or does it have to be during my university career? Yeah, it can definitely count, but hopefully that's not the most recent thing, right? No, but yeah, yeah, absolutely. It put it in there. <laughs> yeah. Awesome. OK, thank you. You're welcome. Harriet, I see that your hand is raised again. Do you want to try using the mic function? One more time. Hello, can you guys hear me? Yay. OK, thank you for waiting. My computer is weird. But anyways, so going back to course requirements, um, I just have like a little like question about like, let's say I do like two courses within one subject, right? Like humanities. And you said we can put forward our best mark. What if like the one, like the best mark is a 2000 level course and like a lower mark is the 3000 level course? Would I, be, would I, it doesn't matter. I can still pick the 2000 one. It could be a oh, 1000 okay. one. Oh, okay. Yeah, Thank I you. That's all I need to know. It, yeah. Uh, your prerequisites can come from any semester. Okay. So we don't have to like top up our marks, right? Nope. Okay. Thank you. Great. Um, Fu, you're next. Sorry, can you hear me okay? Yeah, I can Hello? hear you. Okay. Yep. Go ahead. Uh, so I just have two questions. So uh, one is that um, since uh, I moved uh, to Ontario when I was in 2019 and I start university, so basically how do we... I how do we prove that we have enough of the 12 months residency? Do we need to submit any documentation or um, anything? Uh, the answer is yes, but I'm not sure what they'll ask you for. It's really okay. like the registrar's office that does that. So if you want to know, I would email admdvm at <laughs> uoglof.ca. Um, I mean, typically, I guess it would be things like income taxes or um, even that, like a lease is not really proof that you live here. It means that you rent it here, but it may, you may not actually be here, right? So. I see what you mean. Okay, thank you. And my second question is that um, since um, last year we did Casper, this year we also did Casper, um, do we require a snapshot um, to be done this year? No, nope, just a Casper. Mm -hmm. Just a Casper. Thank you so much. That's all my questions. Sure. Leia, how would you like to unmute and ask your question? I don't think we can hear you. I don't hear anything. Okay. 
why don't we do a couple from the chat? But I think I need to move on. I don't want to take up too much of people's time. So sure. Let me just scroll to the top. There are a lot of questions in the chat. <laughs> Keep in mind, I'm not going to do specific approvals for courses. So if any of the questions are about specific courses that either Guelph or other universities, that's not what I do. Um, that is something that the registrar's office has to do for you. OK, well, this person is asking, um, what if the credit weight is worth five courses, but you're actually just taking four? Is that fine? Yep, but it has to be all in one semester. And um, there's a rule about the fact that you have to have actually done the course in that one semester. So if you're taking a field work course and you've done the field work in summer, but the mark is only applied to the fall semester, that's not going to work. OK, next, um, do the 12 months need to be consecutive? I guess that's for residents. Um, if it is three summers, four months, is that valid? Yeah, that's valid. OK, um, this person is asking if I'm at the University of Guelph currently, but I'm an international student, will I be part of the third international applicants or the domestic applicants? What's your citizenship? Unmute and let me know. Yes, we can follow up with that one. Yeah. Uh, so the rule is it's by citizenship. It's not by where you live, right? So if you are Canadian or a dual citizen, you're Canadian and you'd apply as a Canadian. If you're not a Canadian, you apply as an international student, regardless of where you live. OK, the next question on the chat is if you have lived in multiple provinces, each for 12 consecutive years, do you have the option of which school you would um, like to apply to? Nope. You can only apply to the one that you have the most recent 12 months. The only exception is us, like we will consider if you grew up here, um, but uh, yeah, the other schools, it's the 12 most recent months. OK, this person's asking, can courses be presented from more than one university? Yeah, why not? Perfect. Um, next question is, is a bachelor's degree from Guelph transferable to the Western Vet School, even though credits work differently? I would think so. It's uh, the credits are a bit different, like even between us and McGill. I'll, I'm using McGill as an example because that's where I went. So uh, McGill has uh, uh, I like a one credit course is three credits. Ours, it's 0.5, but it's the same course. So they would just translate it. So, um, yeah, and it's not like it transfers, is that, you know, the courses uh, can be used as prerequisites for the other programs as well, as long as it's like the same course. So you just have to check what, what their prerequisites are. It's, it's different from school to school. OK, the next question um, is asking if it's mandatory to do organic chemistry. Um, Amanda, did you take biochem? I did. Did you have to take organic one and two to get there? Mm, no. No, nope. I think it depends on uh, the school. So um, if your school requires you to take organic chemistry one and two to take biochem, then the answer is yes, you'd have to take it, but we don't need that course. Like this list is what it is. And um, so we need biochemistry, but you know, there are some universities that organic chemistry one and two are prerequisites for the program you're in. So it depends. But for us, we don't need it, no. OK, do we have time for some more? Um, why don't we move along? I'm just conscious of the time. It's already getting late. Ooh. Uh, and so I want to just go through the selection process so people understand how everything comes together. And then we can keep going on the questions because I'm sure um, some of the questions have to do with what I'm just about to talk about. So might as well do that. Um, OK, all right. So let's talk a bit about experience because I know that that 
a lot of people have those questions. So again, this page has lots of information about all the things that you have to do. Um, and then down here, it talks about a veterinary experience. Now, I did mention that we do define veterinary experience as working with a veterinarian. So a veterinarian has to actually supervise you. And uh, when you apply, you'll need two references from veterinarians. So um, make sure when you ask them for a reference that they agree that the reference will be a good one. You don't want to have a bad reference, and I'll explain that in a minute. Um, and again, you don't have to have a minimum number of hours. We don't ask you to get 500 hours of vet experience in order to apply to our program. What's important to us is the quality of the experience because we want you to be sure this is the career for you and that you've done your due diligence and experienced the profession um, in whatever ways you can. And it doesn't have to be clinical experience. It can be experience uh, with a government vet or an industry vet or a research vet. You know, um, a lot of the veterinarians in our faculty are researchers and um, you can uh, work with them over the summer and they can write you a reference and they can be one of your veterinary references. So keep that in mind. It's all about experiencing what the career is and all that it holds for you. Uh, and to make sure that this is really what you want. So it's great to get some variety. Um, uh, you can definitely get all the experience in one clinic. We do try, you know, we try, try to ask you to, you know, try to branch out a little bit. Uh, but if you only have one clinic under your belt, that's fine. We won't reject you for that reason. And both veterinary references can come from the same clinic. So that is OK, too. We ask you to get animal experience, and, and that's because once you start the program, you're going to be working with all kinds of animals, so it's really uh, in your best interest to be comfortable around different animals, and that includes the larger animals, um, all kinds of animals. But you know what? Once you're here, you'll, you'll learn how to do it, so it may be a bit intimidating if you've never touched a cow before, but you'll learn how to do it. Um, and uh, again, it's also about what's good for you because the more comfort level you have with different animals, the easier it is once you have to do it for school, right? And then extracurricular activities uh, is everything else. We, you do have to have something on your application um, that is extracurricular. And like I said, uh, all of those different things can come from one from a clinical experience. Um, but, uh, you know, if you have a summer job, if you've worked at McDonald's, even customer service is a great uh, extracurricular. And um, a lot of it applies to working with your fellow vet students and working with clients once you're done. So really good, very valuable experiences. And please write down, you know, everything you've done, including high school. Uh, make sure that you have a log of all of your um, involvements, including clubs, including all kinds of stuff. And again, you can put the fact that, that you were part of a future vest club as long as you were part of the executive or organizing or doing instead of just sitting there listening. Um, that's a valuable skill. Um, and then uh, references, when you're ready to apply, you need to have three people uh, act as referees for you. Two of them must be veterinarians. They don't necessarily have to be in Canada or Canadian, but we do want you to get some experience in Canada because that's what you're going to be studying when you get to vet school. So it's really important that uh, you understand what it is that you're going to be learning, right? Um, and, you know, if you're going to end up being a vet working in Canada, then it's really good to have some experience in that field before you start to make sure that's what you want to do. Um, your third reference doesn't have to be a vet. It can be a vet, uh, but it should be someone who acted at, in a supervisory role and they can really talk to us about your skills and about your abilities. So don't ask someone who doesn't know you well to do this. It's really important that they know how, know you well enough because in addition to writing a letter, they have to fill in a, a, a grid that asks about 16 different um, character traits or things like um, uh, emotional intelligence, um, you know, reliability, professionalism, all those things. So if they don't know you well, they'll give you a reference that has a lot of um, have not observed, and that's not useful for us. 
Um, so before I go on, I want to show you uh, the document I prepared that just summarizes the um, the process. So we've talked a bit about this stuff. So um, when everyone applies, we wait till we get all of your information, including your marks, and we verify, well, not we, me, but the registrar's office verifies that you have all of the prerequisites and that they're in a full-time semester and that they're done in the right order, all that stuff. Um, so once we make sure that everyone who's applied has what they need, then they're going to be uh, uh, ranked based on the calculation 75% academics, so the academics is half of the average of the last two full-time semesters and half of those eight prerequisite courses uh, that you submitted. And then we have 25% the CASPER score. So your marks here are still 75% of the first ranking. So there's still a huge part of the admissions process. Um, I can't tell you, there's always people that get lost in this process. So it's really important that you apply once you have everything done. Don't apply with anything missing. Don't apply with uh, missing prerequisites. Um, make sure that you are sure that the courses you're putting forward work. Uh, it's a bit easier at the University of Guelph because that we have that list on our website of courses that you can use as prerequisites. If you're from, again, another university, it's always a good idea to send in the course um, uh, course descriptions so that they can be assessed in terms of content to make sure that they are usable as a prerequisite. So make sure you do that maybe even before you take the course. And so we have our first ranking. So the first ranking ranks everyone from number one to the bottom, um, just based on this mix. And that's the uh, what we call the admissions average. Um, then what we do is we take the top 200 from this first ranking and we re review everyone's application. So this is where we actually look at all of your experience, um, all of your background. Uh, we look at your essay. There's an essay that you have to write. Uh, we look at your letters of reference with the grids and um, and we and they're uh, assessed. So what happens is the admissions committee splits up the files and everyone gets read in the top 220. And if there's any flags, that's when they are indicated. So a flag is when there's an issue with your application. The biggest flag is a negative or uh, a wish, like uh, uh, not a very strong letter of recommendation. Don't forget, you're applying to a medical school. So you want to make sure that when you apply to a professional medical school that your um, application is stellar and that your letters of reference are fantastic. And the only way to do that is when you ask the person you want to write you a reference, um, ask them to make sure that they feel comfortable writing you a stellar reference. And that's really important. I know it's not a fun, you know, comfortable conversation to have, but it's vital. You cannot um, imagine how disappointing it is for the members of the committee to see someone who's super bright and looks amazingly, you know, capable to read a letter that says, I don't think that they're ready for the profession yet, um, or I didn't find them to be um, capable. So you really want to be uh, careful about making sure that the people you ask for your references will be comfortable writing you something really great. If they hesitate or if they say, I don't know you well enough, um, don't press the point because every year people get uh, excluded from the process because of a, a bad reference. And it's surprising. I, I shouldn't have to tell people that this is a very important piece to their application, but it is. And it's something that you really have to be on top of. Um, so again, can't say it enough, make sure that you are comfortable um, may asking uh, some of the people that you're asking for a great reference, okay? Um, and um, it used to be that we would have people apply and they didn't have two vets, but that that's in the distant past. I think everyone understands that rule. And uh, we, we very rarely have any issues around that. Um, 
make sure that it's a vet that you've actually worked with. If you, um, sometimes we have people who submit references from a faculty member who taught them a course and the faculty member is a veterinarian. We do not consider that a veterinary reference because you haven't worked with them. Unless you were their TA, then that would be work, that would be fine. Um, and then by the same token, we would not accept a reference from someone who was your veterinarian and looked after your animals, but you never volunteered with them. And they're basing their evaluation on you as a client rather than as a volunteer or um, a fellow employee. OK, so that's also not appropriate. Um, and I guess it should be obvious, but none of your references should be family or should be friends of the family or know you in a capacity that's not professional. It can be an addition, like obviously if it's, uh, um, you know, the veterinarian has uh, worked with your family and that's how you started volunteering with them, that's fine. But if their only relationship with you is through knowing your family or treating your pets, that's not an appropriate reference, okay? So what happens is we look through everybody's application, make sure everything is, you know, all the ducks are in line. And um, uh, then we, we rank everyone from top to bottom. We do take people out whose uh, uh, applications have issues. Um, and then uh, what we do is we do a virtual personal interview with the top 200. So the virtual personal interviews are the last step in the process. And what they are is, um, what we call MMI style. So it's like a multiple mini interview, but online. And there are four what we call stations. Um, and they're all questions that relate to your application. So um, for instance, um, one of the stations could be uh, talk about uh, a veterinary experience that you had that really solidified um, your decision to become a veterinarian. And then, you know, another like, you know, why did why was that uh, that that um, experience so important to you? Um, how what changed for you? Those kind of things. So th that would be that question. So you'd have two minutes to read that question and think about it. You're allowed to uh, have a paper and pen and make notes about what you might want to say. And then after those two minutes are up, then uh, the assessors join you in a virtual room and uh, you get to talk for, I'm trying to remember now, I think it's five minutes um, and answer the question. But they don't interact, like they don't, you know, they don't ask you follow up questions. They just sit and listen to you answering those questions that you have. And uh, while you're doing the interview, the questions are on the screen for you the whole time. So you can look back and make sure that you're touching on all the points. Um, and then at the end, so you have four of those stations, all of them questions about uh, your background, your pathway, you know, your experiences, all that stuff. Uh, and then you get a mark at the end, one for each station and a mark for communication because communication skills are vitally important. And then the mark you get on that interview becomes 35% of your final rank. And that initial mix of academics and Casper becomes 65%. Um, and then everyone gets re-ranked and then the top 100 uh, get offered admissions and most there's no wait list but sometimes what happens is someone decides that they're you know they're not ready or they need to defer or um they decided they don't want to be a veterinarian after all um and if that happens uh then we make an offer to the 101st person in the ranking so if you can do your math really quickly, you can see that academics are still a big piece of the final ranking, uh, about half, right? So it's 75% up here and it becomes about half at the end. So the biggest way that you can make sure that you're in the higher part of the list is by making sure that your marks are really good. So this year, 
I don't know if you guys remember the the uh, marks from last year, but this year they were very close. It was about 91% uh, average for people who got into the program for their admissions the academics. So the last two full time semesters and the um, eight prerequisite courses. And I think it's really high because people understand now how to apply and they know that they have to put forward their best marks and all that. Um, but what was interesting this year is the range was wider. So we, we saw people more in the high 80s uh, getting in to the top 100. And that's because I think the Casper impacted uh, people's ranking in that first mix. Sorry, just give me a sec. That's how the, um, how the process works from beginning to end. Um, in terms of timing, so like you, like if you remember, there's three deadlines. There's December 1st for putting your name in the hat, February 1st for your application. Then when we get your application, uh, your three references are notified by email that they have to fill in an online referee assessment. So if you send in your background information form in January, they have longer to do it. So the earlier you put in your application, the better, because then it gives your assessors more time. And we all know how busy veterinarians are, right? Always a good idea. And then certainly you can remind your assessors to do the applicant, do the referee assessments. You will have everything on WebAdvisor in terms of the status. So you'll see um, oh, when the referee assessments come in. And you can gently remind your vets and your other reference, um, hey, <laughs> could you please do that for me? Um, so just so you know. Uh, and then um, what happens is once we have everybody's transcripts and final uh, marks in March, that's when we do all the rankings and then we do the BIF review in April. And then by uh, third, week of April or so, that's when the invitations to the people who we're going to interview um, are sent out. So uh, typically people get that, to, you know, before the end of April and then the virtual interviews, which are that last step for the top 200, uh, they happen. So last cycle, they happened the last week of May, first week of June, because the beginning of June was like on Wednesday. So the last two days of May and the first three days of June were when we did the virtual interviews. And then the offers went out, I'm thinking second week of June. So that's when you'll know. By usually about mid-June, people know if they have an offer. So that's the timeline for that. Uh, all right, so that's that. So I'm going to put this down now. I'm sure everyone's tired of seeing that. Um, so these are the times, transcripts, Casper references, and that. So that's the process. Um, I'm just trying to think of what else might be useful. I'm going to close this and just go back to the Teams meeting. So let's unshare. Stop sharing. There we go. OK, so um, I'm hoping that's helpful for everybody. Um, I'm just thinking there's a lot of stuff in the chat, so uh, let's see. Do we want to answer questions in the chat, Amanda? What do you think? I see there's a couple of people with hands up, so maybe we'll start with them and then um, we'll go to the chat. I have a feeling everyone has very similar questions, so um, why don't we start with uh, Leia? Do you want to unmute and ask your question? If you want to turn on your camera, you're welcome to as well. Leah, are you there? OK, and uh, so I don't know. Yeah, there you go. OK, I see that your mic went on and went off again. Try again, Leah. OK, now talk. Nope, I don't hear you. Does anyone else hear her? Or is it just me? No, I don't hear anything either. Okay. Well, yeah, maybe um, 
Uh, put your question in the chat and I'll scroll down after. Uh, Katrina, you want to go? Hi, can you hear me? Yep. Awesome. Um, so I did type this out in the chat too, but I figured it was pretty long winded. <laughs> so I just wanted to say it out loud. Um, so I'm in my fourth year and uh, I was required to take a field course. Um, this is kind of a specific question, but you mentioned field courses quickly. Um, and so the field course component was like a lab that was just a week in the summer. Um, now the actual course itself, where there's like weekly meetings, it's during the school year and it's a three credit course. Um, so I was hoping to use this semester as one of my last two full-time semesters, but I was worried just because it's labeled as a field course, it won't count. That's a good question. So um, my sense is that because it's both, right? Like you did yeah. some in the summer and some that they might accept it, but you'll have to go through the registrar's office for that one. Um, yeah. So <laughs> yeah, you know. All right, next is Celine. Hello. I was just wondering, um, does work experience have to be a paid experience or could we use like a volunteer experience that wasn't veterinary or animal based for the application? Yeah, anything. You put everything in your BIF. You, um, so extracurricular is all of that. It's paid, it's jobs, it's volunteering, it's involvement, it's community. Anything that you worked with other people or even, you know, pet owners, whatever, um, put that all in there because it's all really good and very useful stuff. Um, we want to see that you've been out there interacting with people. So, yeah. And is the BIF separated by work experience, volunteer experience, or mm -hmm. is it all in the same? That's kind of what I'm asking is I, if there's oh. a work experience and then a specific extracurricular in the work experience, do I have to put a paid experience? Um, so I usually work does mean paid, uh, but I think it's all under extracurricular and it's def like they give a definition. They say this includes all this stuff. So it's not that one is considered more important than another, um, but I think it's all one. I think it's all one category. OK, perfect. Thank you so much for your help. Argavan? Have I said that right? Sorry, my question is a little um, specific, but I am a transfer student. I I'm not international, I'm domestic, but transfer student. And I had to repeat some of my courses because um, University of Gulf didn't accept it. Um, so I filled up uh, admission requirement accommodation in July and I haven't received anything back. Um, do you have any idea of when exactly or like approximately? I know, I know that they just had a meeting where they made some decisions. So uh you should be hearing soon i'm not sure if they look at yours but uh if you have that uh, what you need to do is you need to make sure that you have that original assessment um so that you can argue that you hadn't didn't have a choice you had to repeat them right okay. um okay candy can you hear me yeah oh, okay okay um so for the assessment by a referee the one that has a lot of check boxes of yep. like average below average um i know that uh you said we should be having like really good references um does that mean that like all of them need to be like the highest um like um box um okay what do you think um i would hope not <laughs> So um, it's not that we would disqualify someone if they don't have all like the highest level, right? Um, but you want to make sure that the people that are doing your references think really well of you, right? Um, and so that they don't give you the lowest one. Like what's worse is a low one, right? Mm -hmm. um, like there's, there's, it's kind of like, I mean, they're pretty, vague categories some of them like emotional intelligence right um so someone you know would say like the best one is you know 
assess can assess very well people's needs or whatever. And then the next one is uh, is adequate. And then the lowest one is uh, can't is not capable. Um, so you know, as long as you're uh, above average or even sometimes average in some things, you know, um, that's not bad. But you certainly don't want to be below average. Um, and if it's just one, you know, we'll go, okay, some of them are more important than others. Like uh, if if someone says that you have very doubtful ethical reasoning, we're going to take a pause and kind of go, oh, well, what, what happened here, right? Um, and that's why we asked them in their letter to talk about anything, you know, meaningful that they put in the grid. Um, so hopefully if they gave you a negative in an area that we consider to be very important, they're commenting it in the letter and saying why they've done that. Um, but no, you don't have to have the highest. Um, yeah, like I said, problematic would be low the lower ones for all of them um, or too many of them that say have not observed because they don't know you well enough. So that to us is what we consider um, uh, an inappropriate reference, and it's just as bad as a negative reference. Okay, yeah, that makes sense. And do all three of our referees um, fill out that um, chart or only the one that supervised us? No, all three of the people that fill it in should have supervised you. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, like the, okay, I get it. Yeah. Right. So two of them have to be veterinarians that you worked with. So they're observing how you are and, you know, as kind of assessing what kind of veterinarian they think you'll make. And then the third person can be a vet, but it should be someone who is was in a supervisory role. I see. I see. OK, thank you. OK. All right, Emily, you're up. Hear me? Go ahead. Yep. Okay. So I kind of have a two part question. It's about references as well. Um, so I guess the first part would be um, my dad is a vet and my first job was um, working with him since he was a practice owner. And I also worked with two other veterinarians. And I was just wondering if those two other veterinarians would be appropriate referees. I know you can't have people be as your reference if they're employed by your family, but he sold the clinic to them and I continue to work under their supervision without my dad, um, I guess, being their boss anymore. So that's, that's a really that's a really good question, Emily. Let me answer it right away. Uh, so if it, if you didn't add that last part, I would have said no. Okay. Um, you have to understand it's a conflict of interest, right? Yes. If someone is working for your father and then they're asked to write a reference, write a reference for the owner's daughter who's paying them their salary, that's a problem, right? Yeah, I but, understand that. But now it's not, so that's fine. So if they were no longer employed, but I was still working with them, that would be okay. That's fine. But you have to make sure that they put that in the letter. So that we understand that, like if they put in, oh, uh, I work for their father and that was the only thing we saw, then we would have a problem. Mm -hmm. Make sure that they point out that they no longer work for the father. I see. OK. And then the second part of my question was, um, since I have worked with my dad, am I still able to declare those experiences on my BIF, um, even though he is a family member? Of course, it's you've done the hours. It's not yeah. like you didn't get the experience, but what you couldn't have done is use him as a reference. Of course, yes, yeah. yeah. Okay, thank you very much. What's he gonna say, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Diva? Hi, can you hear me? Yeah. Um, so I have a couple of questions. And um, like the first one is, so I'm currently in the fall semester of my third year. And I want to apply after I'm done with my third year. So that means that I will have to apply in December 1 of 2023, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, so I apply for that. All right. And uh, regarding the Casper exam, how much prior to the application would I have to do it? So you have to do it within the cycle that you're applying. You can't do the Casper this year for the application next year. So there's a whole bunch of dates on the website. Uh, if you go to the link that's on our website uh, called, I think it's called Take Altus or something. And um, there's a list of dates. Uh, so for us, uh, everyone can write it up until I think the end of 
January, beginning of February. Um, this is due March, right? So, um, uh, yeah. So if you're you're domestic. No, I'm international. So if you're international, it's a little different. The deadlines are different. So um, if you want to apply for next year, the deadline for uh, the application, if you go through VimCAS, is uh, September 15th-ish. And then um, the, the CASPER, you have to write it by, um, I think, the second week of October. OK, all right, thank you. And um, regarding the experience and the references, so if I'm working at a vet clinic and there's one veterinarian and there's one veterinary technician, can my reference out of those two veterinarian ones, can it be from a tech or does it only have to be a veterinarian? OK, can you go back to the website and read what it says about uh, veterinary references? OK, I will. All right. And yeah. another question about experience is, so if I have a work experience in like a clinical setting, but it was through a Canadian organization, I don't know if you know, it's called VIDA, and I found out through the university and it was in Costa Rica. So that is counted though? Since Well, um, we don't like those kind of experiences because uh, basically you're, so is your question about the experience or about a reference? About the experience and a reference, like if it's counted. So so you're paying for that you're it's like you're paying to participate in this experience mm -hmm. so it's a bit problematic for us like the experience itself is okay um okay. we don't want people to just have those kind of experiences because um sterilization uh animal welfare uh you know how you do surgeries is different in those settings that, as opposed to a North American clinical setting. Mm -hmm. um, doesn't mean it's bad, it just means it's different. So, you know, it's so, you're learning how to do medicine. It's good to do it where you're going to practice, right? Okay, so um, references would, I'd rather do it like at the vet clinic that I'm working at in Canada right now. Like those would be the primary source of my references. Yes, yes. Okay. I, I think that's a better idea. And okay. the other thing is with Vida is because you're paying for it, you're asking a vet who's being paid True. to give you that experience for a letter of reference. So That's that right. is to us a conflict of interest. So I can use them as my references, but experience I can. Yeah, that's right. And my last question is, since I'm an international student, are all the deadlines you mentioned the same? Um, I was talking about the Canadian one. OK, so all of the deadlines are not the same. Um, and if you look at the website, it does have them. So your first deadline is depending on if you're playing on Vimcast or not. Mm -hmm. uh, so Vimcast opens in uh, May, I think, and then it goes all the way over the summer till mid-September. And okay. usually mid-September is the, the deadline. Um, and then for the Casper, we need that by November 1st. Mm -hmm. So you can write up until the second week of October. Um, and then um, all the other documents have to be in our hands. Well, if it's Vimcast, it's that September deadline. Okay. But I think October 1st is for if you're sending stuff separately. OK, all right. That's all my questions. Thank you yeah. so much. You're welcome. Yeah, but just read over our website because uh, the timeline for internationals is much different. All right, thank you. You're welcome. All right, I'm not sure if it's Alicia or Alyssa, but you can correct me. Hi, can you hear me? Yep. Uh, it's Alyssa, but that's okay. Um, yep. My question is um, just about experience with animals, like animal experience. Um, I've lived on a farm my entire life and I've worked with like a variety of different like farm animals and stuff like that. So could I kind of like count that as and oh yeah, it? absolutely. Okay, perfect. Good for you. Yeah, we do Thank have. And we love we love farm kids. So, okay, perfect. Thank you. Uh, Diva, did you already go? Was that still the same hand that you had up? Hi. Yes. Yeah, sorry, it is. I'll take it down. Thank you. Okay, Elaine. Hi. Um, I was just wondering. Um. I know there's no interview scores, but um, like I was wondering what the criteria is that the vets are looking for, um, like for the interview, like um, like what they're like. You were saying communication. Is there anything else? 
Well, um, I think, yeah, I mean, it's like a multiple mini interview. So basically what they're judging you on is how wholesome your responses are and how well you're answering the questions. Okay. Um, we'll see. Like, I can't give you more information because once you see what the, how the questions are, what they are, it'll make a lot of sense. <laughs> it's um, asking you to make like links with stuff. So, Elaine, oh, that was that was just you, right? No, Stephen. Yeah. Oh, Elaine, are you sorry? So you didn't get to ask your question? No, 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 I did. That was me from before. I, I, awesome. Okay, I'm losing track, guys. Sorry. All right, Stephen, go ahead. Hello, I was wondering uh, what your thoughts were on about like including working at a, can a cannabis dispensary as a working experience, because I've heard some people recommend that I should, but also some say that I shouldn't. Why shouldn't you? Pardon? It's a job. It, it, yeah, it, like, well, it just kind of like my thought process, like it has to do with like, uh, like customer experience and also how like there's like um, like CBD and other things like related with like animal experience and like research. So I just want to like like get your thoughts on that i think uh, i don't know it means legal right <laughs> so it's not like it would be uh an ethical question um but yeah anything that has to do with people is good to put in your application because that's a huge part of veterinary medicine right okay thank you so much sure hard shot hello can you hear me yep awesome so I know this meeting is more undergrad focused, um, but I was wondering if you had any resources on applying as a graduate student. I'm in my undergrad, but I would like to apply later. I checked the OVC website and it seems that a lot of the requirements are literally the same as undergrad. Is that yeah, true? The, the, yeah, the academic stuff is uh, the same. Uh, however, so just to clarify, graduate cohort doesn't mean people who've graduated. It means we'll have done a graduate degree. So if you finish your bachelor's degree and have decided to wait a while to apply, you're still an undergrad cohort. Um, so grad cohort is really for someone who either, either is in a master's degree or a PhD um, and wants to fold into their application all the great stuff they did in research. And it doesn't have to be science research. It doesn't have to be like animal related. But one of the biggest things that we look for in the grad cohort are is what we call productivity and productivity is things like publications, uh, um, presentations at conferences, publish publication of abstracts, excuse me. Um, so things like that. So the only way uh, that you could possibly have done that is by doing a pretty rigorous science or uh, research based um, graduate degree. Um, so that's kind of what we say, like if you've done that and you feel that you'd be competitive and want to kind of promote your your accomplishments that way, then that's a choice for you. And then you in terms that? of like you mentioned the like competitive aspect of it, I noticed on the website it says that approximately five students are admitted through the graduate cohort. Is yep. that because like less students are looked at or like less students apply? It's because that's the cohort. So uh, we have so many seats for so many cohorts, right? The class is 120 and 100 of those are for undergrad. Five of those are for grad cohort. Um, and then 15 or more are for our, the international students. So that's just the way the class is made up, right? So okay. um, each year for the five spots, we get anywhere from, I don't know, 15 to 29 students. That's been the range. Okay. okay. And then do you have any resources outside of the OVC website that I could take a look at? Because I want to apply like later after I do some graduate schooling. What are you looking for in terms of a resource? Um, <clears throat> I'm not sure. Just like I said, like maybe like. Like, uh, I found on the OVC website that, like, it just kind of discussed, like, the undergraduate cohort instead of the graduate one. So, like, you mentioned, like, um, like productivity, or if there's any details regarding that aspect of it. It's, uh, I don't know if it's there, but I thought that there was a link to the graduate cohort form that you need to fill in. 
And that's really the only additional piece that you need for grad cohort. And that would explain what we're looking for. Okay, so okay. if you can't we'll find it, forward. yeah, if you can't find it, let me know. Could be that the link got lost somewhere. Um, but the best resource is probably someone who got in with that cohort, and I can probably connect you with someone. Okay, sounds okay. good. Thank you so much. Okay. All right, Sue. Hi, uh, my question is that uh, right now I'm in fourth year and I'm taking a thesis course at my university and that thesis course lasts for um, two semester. And I was just wondering, um, uh, I'm afraid that the marks of that thesis course won't be out by March yet. So it will appear, still appear on my transcript. However, it will appear, it won't have um, specific marks yet. So would my semester, the fall 2022 semester, would that semester be count in um, the calculation of my admission average? Nope. Okay, thank you. Yeah. That's the only question I have. I mean, you could still use the courses as prerequisites in mm -hmm. that semester because it's still full time, but we don't have a final mark for it. I see, yeah. Uh, okay, thank you. You're welcome. Brayden? Are you talking, Brayden? Because I don't hear you. I see that you're unmuted. I don't hear anything. Oh, try now. Nope. Sorry. Try again. Do you want to type your question in the chat? Uh, for the references, it's three. Um, for grad cohort, it's four. So it's a little different, but we won't talk about grad cohort right now. Um, so there's three references that you need. It's uh, two veterinarians and a third person who can uh, who supervise you in some way. Um, and it could be a third vet if you want, but uh, yeah, it's three vets all together. Does that answer your question? Yes, no? Okay. Um, good. So Julia? Hi, um, so I did have a couple questions. Um, so for example, uh, like for cell biology or genetics, does the course code have to be like BIOL or can it be like MCB or? It's all about the content. It's not about the, okay. it doesn't matter. Yeah. Okay. Um, and sorry, I have them written down. So I just wanna, okay. Um, so I did, I was at, um, like, like I'm in Guelph now, but I was in a different um, college before. Um, and I did read somewhere online that it says um, once a person reaches 10 credits, they're considered a third year student and 60% of courses must be 3000 levels or higher. Yep. Um, since I have transfer credits from my previous school, that just means that by like my second semester and my second year at Guelph, I'd have to start taking 3000 level courses, I think. But the only problem is, is that I do have like prerequisites that would wouldn't be in the 3000 level course. And I'm just a little worried about not having that, not like fulfilling that 60% um, like requirement. So what are, like what do I do in those situations? I would say um, make an appointment with uh, Wendy at ADM DVM and just Make sure that you're doing the right thing. Uh, sorry, you They're said the, a, a, where was it? Sorry. A, I'm going to type it in the chat. ADM DVM. Hold on a second. My gosh, there's a lot of stuff. <laughs> there. Okay, so that's the email for the registrar's office, and they will answer all your like course related questions. Okay. Okay. Um, so yeah, so I guess 
I'll just ask one more question, then if I have more, I'll like maybe ask later if you have enough time. But um, yeah. so for example, like um, let's just say like I took a one thousand level statistics course, like it was like S T A T. Um, and let's just say I didn't like do well in that one or something, but I wanted to take like another statistics course, but it was like a different code, like it wasn't S T A T, but it was still considered a statistics but it was at the 1000 level does that still count or do, do i have to go to it does. Level? yeah okay. you have to, you can't repeat content that's the issue okay so it has nothing to do with uh with course numbers or year it has to do with content so you have to make sure that you're not repeating a course okay okay thank you okay riley Hello, can you hear me? Yeah. I have three quick questions. Um, firstly, regarding, um, I'm from a different school. So, okay. and I was previously unsuccessful. Do I need to resubmit a course evaluation request even though my courses are all the same? No. Okay, and to add on to that, uh, do I need to resubmit my transcripts? Yes. yes? I think so, yes. Okay. The second question is regarding essays. Um, let's say, very hypothetically, I wrote the best essay I possibly could in Emmet, like three characters away from max limit. Is there a self plagiarism thing? Can I submit the exact same essay a second time? Yeah, why not? It's your work. Okay, awesome. And the third question is statistics related. Um, do you know what the number of success, the, the percentage of successful applicants is that? have reapplied. So of the people who weren't successful and reapplied again, how many of those actually get in as a percentage? I don't know. Um, you know what the registrar might know, but I do know that every year we ask people, uh, like, how many times did you apply? Like, the people in the class. So there's the majority are first, like, they got in on their first try, but there's always, like, quite a few from set that are second attempts, third attempts, and fourth. And you know, this is where I say it is a competitive program. Um, and certainly if, you know, you need support after hearing that you didn't get in, please get support. Or if you're struggling, you know, there's lots of uh, resources for you at the university, wherever you go. Um, please avail yourself of them because you don't want to, to you know, to suffer. Um, and you may not be doing as well as you can be based on whatever challenges you have, right? Um, so the reality is is that there's not an as many seats as there are people who want to have a uh, veterinary education so it, you know every year of course we're going to see people who are disappointed and and it's not a reflection on them it's a reflection on the stellar pool like the difference between the person the last person who got in like number 100 and number 101 is a fraction of a percent sometimes you know so it's really not that you're not good enough it's that everyone is amazing and you're just as amazing but someone has a slightly higher average right please look at it that way like it's not that you're if you don't get into the program on your first try you know it's not necessarily because you're not a competitive applicant it's because it's such a an amazing group of people and you know I'm amazed at some of the things people have done that have gotten into the program. So, you know, people are, they're amazing. <laughs> the students in the program are amazing, you know, uh, and they're all different. They're all varied. So, um, you know, unfortunately, uh, like, for instance, this year we had over, hmm, I'm thinking, I can't remember the exact number, but it was uh, around 350 people who um, had everything they needed to apply in terms of prerequisites um, for the 100 spots. So that means that 250 people got a no. And that's heartbreaking, but that's, you know, every vet program in the world has the same problem. Um, the only thing I can say, uh, in addition to keep trying and making sure that you get support if you need it, is that if it turns out that you can't get into Guelph, there are other options for you. Um, and um, there are a lot of international schools that accept Canadians. They do super well. Uh, you know, anecdotally, I've had feedback from my 
uh, colleagues at the UK schools and they love the Canadians because they really thrive in their schools. And yes, it's expensive. Uh, OSAP will help you a bit, but you know, it is it is an expensive prospect. Um, on the other end, you know, banks are very willing to provide uh, loans for people who go to vet school because they know you're going to end up with a fantastic job at the end and a pretty good salary. So, you know, um, I do think it's worth trying if you're if your heart is totally set on becoming a veterinarian. Um, don't give up. Keep trying, even if it takes you four tries, who cares? You know, um, at the end of the DVM program, the person who tried four times and got in and the person who got in on their first one, the first attempt, they're both going to be called doctor. No, nobody's going to know, right? Um, yeah, I hope that answers your question. I think it was a bit of a long well, answer. It was, but... it was really more of a statistics question. Just, you know, if 80 people yeah. are applying a second time, how many of them got in? That, that was really my question. Yeah, I don't have that answer. I do know that every year in the class there are people that have tried twice or three times, sometimes even four, um, that have gotten in. But I couldn't tell you what the ratio was to how many applied. Okay. Um, slightly related to that, I am curious as to the rationale as to why we're comparing, for example, I don't know, like a fourth year fluid mechanics class to first year English in the same pool. So you what, also what do you might mean? not have the answer for that. That's totally fine. Are you talking about like prerequisites for like? Uh, uh, um, in the, in the, not the prerequisites, the other 10 courses of your last two semesters. I, I'm not sure I understand your question. Um, part of your academic average is the 10 most recent courses you have taken. I'm yep. curious as the rationale as to why one person can be taking fourth year fluid mechanics or something like that, and someone else can be taking, you know, first year English or something. Well, the rule is, is that uh, in your last two years, you have to take 60% third and fourth year courses. So yeah, certainly someone can have uh, a first year course in their last year, but it's not going to be the majority of their courses. And, um, you know, we know, we only look at their last two full-time semesters because we know that as people go up in their degree programs, they tend to do better because they're focusing on courses that they really enjoy and that they're focused on um, their area of interest. Uh, so we want to be able to compare apples to apples, right? Yes. And we have people Excellent. in engineering, right, that apply. So it could be someone who's in fourth year engineering and, you know, uh, I don't know comparing an art degree to an engineering degree is comparing apples to apples, but, you know, uh, the rationale was that we want to have uh, allow our applicants to put their best foot forward, so to speak, and apply with the courses they choose and their last two full time semesters. So. OK, awesome. Thank you. You're welcome. Faith. Hi. Hi. Um, so I mean, first of all, I just wanted to make sure that uh, when submitting the forms, like for the Casper score, when we finish the test, is all is it just that we have to give permission for the website to give it to university? Is that yep. all we have to do? Yep. Okay. Okay. Um. So I also heard from a student in OBC currently that it's better to have experiences outside of veterinary medicine, such as like hobbies or volunteering. So I was just wondering if the OVC really looked at that or not. Um, did you hear my talk on the BIF and what you have to put in it? Uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so, um, you have to have all of that. You okay. can't, it's not that one is more important than the other, you have to have all of it. Mm -hmm. Um, so, uh, one of the things that's really important to us is that you can work well with other people. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you can get that with veterinary experience too, but the reality is we like you to have a lot of other stuff happening because then we know that you've you know you've dealt with those difficult situations or difficult people you're going to work with all kinds of people in the program and then after the program so the more you have those skills honed the better for you right mm -hmm. yeah i definitely know about that <laughs> um and i just have two more questions left um if you apply in fourth year and you 
don't continue to take courses after that year. Like, for example, you finish your program, but you don't get into OVC when you apply that year. Like, would the next application still be considered an undergrad application, or do you have to take another year in order to apply to OVC? No, no, you can apply even 10 years after you've finished your bachelor's degree and still be an undergrad applicant. Oh, OK. Yeah. And my last question is, um, can you receive a letter of reference from the vet instead of having them complete like an online assessment? Nope. Oh, OK. They have to they have to fill it in online. OK, OK, thank you. You're welcome. Shelly? The question for the essay is the same, will be the same this year as it was last year. Yeah, I believe so. We follow the lead of MCAS, and I don't think they changed it this year. So, yeah. Steven? Hi, can you hear me? Yep. Okay, thank you. Um, I just wanted to ask, um, I'm not sure if you could speak to maybe, uh, you mentioned it before, like about uh, OBC's uh, full course load requirement um, and how like different universities have different definitions of full-time and part-time actual study requirements, um, which like I understand that part, but like for example, at even at the University of Guelph, even four courses is considered, like I think you said, um, even four courses is considered full-time study. Um, but what I've been told is that there are students in OVC that are that have been and are still registered with SAS, like Student Accessibility Services. Um, are you able to speak towards like is there um, consideration like for students if they were advised to take a reduced course load by a professional um, or are they like categorized differently or thought of differently? Uh, yeah, so um, uh, the way it works is we will allow people to apply with less than five courses per semester, provided that they've gone through the process to seek academic consideration. And that's uh, kind of talked about on our website. So yeah, if you if you have a disability and you're registered with SAS, then definitely you can go through that process. But you have to have proof that you are being told that you need to do it that way, right? It's not a choice thing. Um, and then once they come to uh, the vet school, then they're accommodated too. Like right now, um, it's 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 doable to do it part time, although uh, it's uh, what's the word? Um, it, it's a little more challenging in the vet program to do um, uh, the courses uh, part time. So Emily, I think you're next. Hi, uh, are you able to hear me? Yep. Uh, so I just wanted to ask a question about something you kind of said earlier. It's not super important, but uh, it's my understanding from the website that putting something like, oh, like I own dogs or cats is not acceptable for animal experience. But I thought I had heard you kind of mention quickly that it's acceptable for an extracurricular. Is that no? Is that true? No. OK, no. OK. I thought I had misheard and I, th I thought, oh, that doesn't sound right. So I just wanted to check. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, Kendra? Hi, can you hear me? Yep. All right, so I have two questions. I am a non-degree student right now, and I'm planning on starting my master's in January, and I know that I have to apply for the first deadline by December 1st for the internal transfer, but I'm wondering if me applying to my master's to start in January will affect anything because I'm doing both applications at the University of Guelph. Uh, it's not going to affect us because we don't know about it. Like we don't ask for that information. Um, however, if you're accepted and you start your master's, uh, it might not be a happy oh. thing for your 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 PI. So yeah, and they already do know this plan. That's just I just wanted to double check because he wasn't sure what order I had to do it in or whatever. Uh, no, I mean, we do say if you're going to apply for the ma the grad cohort that you have to have finished at least three semesters and you have to have submitted your thesis by uh, August, I think. Okay, but I'm still fine to just apply in the regular grad cohort, but still start and kind of continue. No, you're in, you'd be undergrad cohort. You're not Sorry, undergrad yes. cohort. Yeah, yeah. undergrad. Right. Exactly. 
And then my next question is, do you know when the admission statistics from the class of 2026 will be coming out? No, I don't. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Thank you. You're welcome. All right. Um, we'll take uh, one more, Shadi, and then I want to go into the, I know there's a ton of questions in the chat, so let's go there after. So first we'll do Shadi, okay? <laughs> go ahead. Hi there, can you hear me? I can hear you. Perfect. I was just wondering um, for the elective, um, well, I guess the prerequisites for the humanities elective, it said that we should have like one credit. So usually that's two courses. Would I be able to, because um, I took a course that was one credit, would I be able to use the mark for that as well as a course that was 0.5 credits or with the one credit one? Could I, I think only? You could, I think you can choose to do either from what I understand. Okay, so I could use like both of them, both the mark from the yeah. one credit plus. Or you can you or you can choose to take the one credit course as both. Okay, but if I wanted to use both the one credit course and the mark from a 0.5 credit course, would that be okay? Yeah, I think so. Okay, thank you. And then, sorry, mm -hmm. just one more thing. Um, for the extracurriculars, um, if somebody were to like play an instrument and they did that in a band setting like during high school, um, would they be able and they continue to play that instrument throughout university but didn't really have it in a band setting? Um, would they still be able to like talk about that as an extracurricular? Okay, you know, it's a good question. And I think everyone uh, here, we miss, we've lost half our audience, unfortunately. But um, whenever you guys want to put something in your application, think about why we're asking for that information. So, um, Extracurriculars, I've kind of hinted at what we're looking for. Um, so why do you think we're asking people to write down all of their extracurriculars? Um, I think just because it shows you're more of a balanced person and like not just academic focus, maybe. I would say that that's not a bad idea. But I think part of it, too, is that you have to remember everything we're asking for relates to us seeing you as a future veterinarian, right? Um, and also accepting people that we know that are, are going to succeed in the program. So our admission requirements are trying to set you up so that you are going to do the best you can while you're here. Um, so extracurriculars are uh, one way of us making sure that you have some of the non-academic skills that we're looking for. So if you're playing an instrument without working with other people, it's not as interesting to us as if you're part of a band. So same thing with sports. Sports are considered extracurriculars, but it's more valuable to us if you're part of a team and you don't have to necessarily be compete, but you know, if you're a coach or uh, if you have, you know, you have to work with other members of a team rather than a white jog every day. That to us is not so much an extracurricular. This the involvement with other people that's important to us. OK, that makes sense. Thank you so much. Yeah, OK, so let's try to go through the chat a little bit. Um, for those of you who can stay, I'm happy to keep chatting. Um, I do want to introduce. Oh my gosh, there's a lot in the chat here. Um, I do want to introduce a couple of people that uh, are here tonight that are from the Future Vets Club at the University of Guelph. Um, uh, Amanda, are you still here or did you have to run off? Yep, no, I'm here. OK, so can you turn on your camera and just say hi to everybody? And is there anyone else from the exec in here? Yeah, there definitely are some exec. I've seen some names. OK, so everyone who's on the executive of the Future Vets Club, please turn on your camera and say hi to everyone. Um, so these people that are now appearing before you are people who um, can uh, chat with you about the club and what they do. Uh, this is Sydney um, and uh, Elena and Katarina. And where are you? I don't see you, Amanda. Is your camera you can't see me. I'm over here. <laughs> and there's Nick. So, OK, Nick and Amanda are the co-presidents. And then why don't you guys introduce yourself in alphabetical order by first name? There's a challenge for you. So that means I think Amanda would go first. No, Alina, you would go first. Sorry. You're right. 
Hi everyone, I'm Elena. I am the communications officer for the Future Vets Club. So anytime you guys send an email to fec at uoguelph.ca, I'm the person who's seeing that. I also send out the listserv, so maybe that's how you found out about our meeting tonight. Um, I guess Amanda's going next then. Yeah, and can you see me? I turned my camera on. We still can't see you. What? That's so strange. My camera says that it's on, so this must be an issue on my end. Um, but yes, my name is Amanda. I have glasses and kind of gingerish hair. Um, hopefully we get to meet at some point in person. I'm one of the co-presidents of the Future Vets Club. Um, yeah, and I hope we all have an opportunity to interact. I was also going to suggest if you're interested in becoming a member of the Future Vets Club, we do have um, our fall general meeting taking place on September 21st. So maybe if we could put in um, either FBC's email or I can put in my own personal email and you can reach out to us letting us know that you're interested so we can send you um, the information for that meeting. Or if you are coming from another university or can't join in person, we'll also be having a virtual option for the PowerPoint presentation. Um, so we'll send you the link to that as well. So yeah, nice to meet you all. <laughs> and I'll pass it on. I can't see any names either because my Teams is a little wonky, but who's next? Uh, Katerina, I think you're next. Hi, I'm Katie. I'm in third year of animal biology and I'm an exec assistant on the Future Vets Club. Uh, Nix, I think you're next. We don't hear you. No. So we have one person with no camera <laughs> and sound, and one person with sound with a camera but no sound. Oh, now you're frozen, Nix. Well, can you hear me now? Yes. Okay, perfect. I'm so sorry, I'm out. I just left uh, OVC. Um, I had to go to a lab there. But hello, uh, my name is Niharika, and I am one of the co-presidents of the Future Vets Club. It is so nice to see all of you virtually uh, with your camera shut off. But no, it's great that you guys are here. Um, if you would like to learn more about the club, as Amanda said, uh, we have our fall general meeting um, coming up on the 21st of September. And um, our most recent event uh, that is taking place tomorrow is the trivia. It's going to be at um, the SSC atrium at 6 p.m., 6.30 p.m. Um, so if you guys are interested, it would be great to see you there. Don't forget that there's uh, club days the next couple of days in the UC. Yeah. And uh, Future Vets Club has a table, so please come by. You can sign up for the club. And Sydney. Hi everyone, uh, my name is Sydney. Uh, I am the senior treasurer for the Future Vets Club um, and I am in my third year of animal biology. Awesome, thanks guys. Um, just to also, there is a, a, a University of Future Vets Club uh, Facebook group and Instagram and uh, Snapchat, I believe. Uh, so all those things you can find and uh, you can join those and uh, you don't have to be an actual member to be part of the club. So, but if you want to join, you're welcome to. Okay, I think a lot of people actually ask these questions um, while we were in the meeting. So... Yeah, it looks like a lot of the questions that are here. Um, yeah, uh, there is a question here. Can we take the Casper multiple times to improve our results? The answer is no, I don't think so. I think you can only take it one time per cycle, but I might be wrong. That's from what I what I understand. Um, but I the guess the best people to answer that is Casper. Um, so just go to their website and ask them that question. And if I'm wrong, let me know, please. Um, but yeah, so. Uh, you do have to retake it every year, though. Every year you apply. So Kyla uh, asked about um, the fact that uh, if you have everything done, all your prerequisites and all your semesters, and you're happy with your marks, um, you can start taking less than full-time semesters, and that's, those just won't count for your application. You won't be penalized. But if you take, let's say, uh, you want to apply for next fall, and you've already done everything, so you don't need to count this semester. You can take four courses, and it automatically wouldn't be counted, uh, either for prerequisites or for the last two full-time semesters, and you can just automatically uh, use your last two before that. 
Field course. Uh, so Carla also asked, what is the last date we are able to take the Casper? So if you're domestic, I believe the last date is uh, the probably either the first week of February or the last week of January. I believe that's what it was last year. Um, but those the dates are listed on Casper on the site. If you go in and click on Ontario Veterinary College, um, then it'll give you the dates that you're able to write and have the score sent to us in time for uh, the competition. Yeah, so uh, Hope asked about uh, if we worked with two vets in the same clinic, can we use both of them as references or do we need someone from a different clinic? And the answer is yes, you can use them. That's fine. It's just we'd like you to diversify your experience a little bit just to get, you know, different experiences, see what you like, see what you don't like. It's important to know. Um, OK. Yeah, so Ava, are you still here? I guess you have to leave. Uh, so Ava was asking about um, uh, to confirm if you are applying as soon as you can during third year of undergrad, then your last two full time semesters for academic average would be considered winter of second and fall of third year. Yes, that's right. If you are in fourth year, do both of your semesters need three or fourth year level courses, 60% have to be that high. And again, that rule is basically because we want to make sure that you're not taking too easy a course load so that you're kind of, you know, getting like marks that are really high because you're you're taking first year courses. If I want to apply after my third year, which gets over in winter 2023, does that mean I have to apply in December of 2023? Yes. Leia, I believe, um, she asks, um, I was curious, do your first and second year have to be full time years in order to qualify for OVC? So uh, the rule is you have to have at least four semesters that have five courses each in uh, under your belt before you're able to apply. So typically that will be for first and second year. Um, but I mean, if you took one semester in first year, that was four, four courses. Then you'd need to de be dealing four more with five, and that would include, I guess, a semester in third year. As long as it's under your belt, it's good. Uh, so for vet experience, do animals have to be present, uh, e.g. lab work? Cassandra, that's a great question. I'm not sure if you're still here, um, but uh, no, the answer is no. What we want you to do is we want you to gain experiences uh, around the veterinary career, and not all veterinary careers involve animals. So it could be research, could be, um, you know, uh, disease modeling like epidemiology, in some cases, it could be a uh, lab animal, well, those an and that's animal. Um, it could be working for the government or working for industry. So all those things count as long as it's a DVM uh, and you're exploring the career. So that's good for us. All right. I think I did answer quite a few of these. I'm sorry we ran really late, so it's been two hours and I don't want people to like be zombified. Uh <laughs> So, um, yeah, so if you have any questions, uh, you can certainly reach out to me. My email is vetmed at uoguel.ca. And uh, if any of you are from other schools and you want me to do a presentation just for your school, I'd be happy to do that. Um, otherwise, if there's no pressing questions, um, if you have an urgent question that you need answered right now, please raise your hand before we uh, close for the evening. But if not, um, thank you all for hanging in there for uh, for the two hour stretch. And uh, I'm really glad that you could make it. And um, thanks for being here. Good luck, everybody.